Good evening, you're on the smoking section with Stephen Helfer, and uh, I just got back from a three-week vacation. Uh, you know, it's funny because I'm retired, so the idea of taking a vacation in retirement is kind of uh, an oxymoron, I guess you might say, or something like that, whatever that is. But um, I had traveled by Amtrak and public bus and uh, Greyhound bus and uh, was taken good care of by both of those corporations, those evil corporations. Uh, they took very good care of me, provided me very safe and uh, relaxing service and uh, got me to where I wanted to go. And of course, I was happy. Uh, part, partially, I'm, I, I, I like Greyhound Bus uh, because it stops more and I can take more smoke breaks. Uh, they stop about every four hours and uh, I would say a higher percentage of people on Greyhound Buses smoke than on Amtrak because the demography of Greyhound is lower income than uh, Amtrak, I would guess. Uh, and uh, so, as we all know, uh, lower income people smoke at much higher rates than upper income people, and people with mental disabilities smoke at higher rates than people who don't have mental disabilities. And in some ways this is really helpful because, of course, certainly for people with mental disabilities, uh, tobacco is a great, great uh, benefit. It uh, helps them concentrate, uses anxiety, depression, reduces boredom. Uh, and, uh, and then again, for people who are low income, of course, uh, smoking reduces the appetite, so uh, instead of going into a store and spending 10 or $12 on a sandwich and a drink, uh, if you have a cigarette, which of course is very expensive depending on where you are, uh, it will make you perhaps avoid that meal, keep you thinner, and not fill you up with all kinds of uh, Food you probably don't need. I uh, noticed a lot of times on my trip that uh, I probably eat about twice as much food as I really need. So on different parts of my trip, uh, when uh, I would just have a sandwich for dinner as opposed to a, a grand meal, which I often have. But I think human beings have a tendency to overeat. Uh, and cigarette smoking, or certainly tobacco, helps ease that. Um, and Certainly when food is uh, in short supply, uh, like it is in many parts of the world, or for many people in this country even, uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, helpful to smoke uh, and uh, reduces your appetite. And therefore, uh, one of the reasons, of course, that we see so many hip operations and knee operations uh, nowadays is because so many of the baby boomers have given up smoking and put on an extra 20 or 30 pounds and eventually that uh, wears down the joints of the knees and, and so forth and uh, of course also uh, why we see so many people taking psychoactive medication again is because I think uh, is causally related to the decrease in smoking and of course pharmaceutical companies uh, while I think many of their drugs are very helpful uh, I think that they know that the fewer people who smoke the more pe anxious people will be and the more inclined they will be to uh, take Prozac, Zoloft, Xanax etc 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 and, of course, I think to some degree the medical profession uh, must know that tobacco does provide a great deal of comfort to people and that uh, since it's non-prescription, uh, they don't get a cut, uh, which they do from all of these other uh, drugs and whatnot.
Of course, I don't consider tobacco a drug. But then again, the definition of drug is so broad. I mean, I think the World Health Organization uh, defines drug basically as just about anything that affects the body or the mind. Uh, and of course, a glass of water uh, does that. Chamomile tea does that. The best uh, definition of drug I've ever seen uh, was anything which administered to a rat produces two scientific papers. That's the definition of drug. Uh, I was reading, uh, but anyway, I noticed that um, on the Amtrak train and on the Greyhound buses, I think the people that were the most sociable were the smokers. Now, uh, part of that is because we all piled off the Amtrak train uh, whenever there was a stop where we could smoke, and it, uh, we would uh, bond a bit. And then we'd get back on the train and we'd talk about when the next stop is. And so it was uh, something that was very bonding. And, but I do think people, uh, that smoking is something that uh, is a very social uh, thing. I mean, eating is social, drinking alcohol is social. And um, as I've said many times on the program, I think that if more of our legislators and political leaders uh, smoked, uh, that we would have a much better functioning government. Uh, out, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, in fact, when he was the governor of California, set up a smoking tent outside of the state legislator, state legislation, late state legislative building, the Capitol, and many of the deals that he brokered uh, were brokered over fine cigars. Uh, and, of course, that's very reminiscent of the American Indian who would never have, never think of having uh, a council without the benefit of tobacco. I think also Martin Luther King uh, was a smoker and many people in the civil rights movement were smokers, and I think uh, their use of tobacco helped them uh, very much to organize and to get over differences. And, and that is, I think tobacco is to some degree, not entirely, but to some degree, uh, was responsible for the uh, great success in the um, in the uh, civil rights movement of the 60s. Uh, nowadays, I guess people just uh, don't bond, they don't, don't have that uh, kind of bondingness that comes from tobacco and that kind of help it provides, especially in councils, uh, councils of war, councils of peace, uh, and uh, the like. Now, I was uh, looking at the New York Times this Sunday, and of course, I came upon another story uh, supposedly about uh, the possible dangers of vaping uh, for youngsters. And, um, and as I said, you know, people who write newspapers, uh, to, in my, for most of the time, I have a, a great deal of respect for journalists um, but, uh, and for newspapers, but they do have an inherent bias, an unavoidable bias, and that bias is to print things that will interest the public and that the public will read. And that usually means that, for example, uh, if there is an, in, an inclination to always be printing uh, something or publishing something or writing something about a latest crisis, um, so that uh, the public will read it and become disturbed or excited or what have you. So there is this inclination on the part of journalists to uh, kind of uh, look for the bad uh, badness in things and something that might get people excited. So the uh, electronic cigarette deal is, is really um, is something that the, that I think they have an inherent bias against. And 
uh, you know, it, there was a time a couple of years ago within the last five years when they were constantly talking about, uh, you know, the dangers that e-liquid posed, you know, for poisonings and overdoses. And it's funny because as time has gone on, uh, and there have been almost none, maybe there are zero, I don't know, uh, of anybody dying from an overdose or getting even sick from an overdose of e-liquid or children opening a bottle and drinking uh, some e-liquid, uh, that's completely disappeared. They don't ever talk about that anymore. So five years ago, it was, oh my gosh, you know, this e-liquid is around and children are going to get it and adults are going to overdose on it. Now it's completely forgotten. But now the thing is, oh, isn't it terrible that uh, teenagers, uh, a certain percentage of teenagers are smoking electronic cigarettes? Uh, I think it's a very, very, very small percentage. Uh, but, of course, they don't, they always talk about how it's gotten bigger. Well, you know, that's a trick of statistics. Like if something is 2% uh, of teenagers smoke electronic cigarettes and the next year it's 4%, still a very small number, but that's what's called a 100% increase. And, of course, if you don't say what the... <clears throat> Uh, what the real numbers are, but you simply say a percentage, uh, it sounds much, much more exciting or disturbing than it really is. I, I noticed that uh, with uh, Hernandez, uh, for example, uh, they said that his brain uh, had a certain kind of damage to it that the wor was the worst they'd ever seen in a 28-year-old uh, brain. Well, my guess is uh, they have actually looked at almost no 28-year-old brain. So if they had just looked at 5 or 10 and Hernandez's was worse, uh, it would be, you know, strictly speaking, they would be honest saying it's the worst they've seen, but uh, there are not that many 28-year-olds whose brains they have examined, I would assume. So, but this article in the... <clears throat> New York Times talks about how teenagers these days have become almost puritanical. There are illicit drug, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, of course, the only way the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, is able to get these statistics is by surveying, anonymous surveys of, of teenagers. So none of us know how accurate that is. Uh, I don't think there's any effort to determine how accurate it is, but they compare it from year to year, and the number of students who are uh, taking illicit drugs or smoking is at the lowest it's ever been uh, since the CDC tracked it. And soda consumption is down. Uh, very few teenagers abuse opioids. Um, and illicit drug use of, of all sorts has dropped. So it's funny because uh, as I say, the uh, article, the, uh, the, the writer said that the teenagers of today are almost puritanical. And, um, but one thing they did talk about was how a recent study done at NYU shows that when exposing mice, laboratory mice, to e-vapor for two weeks, they suffered DNA damage. And that is kind of laughable to me uh, because, I mean, first of all, I'd like to know who funded the experiment and what were they, probably some anti-smoking organization or anti-vaping organization. But it brought me up some research I had done um, which uh, talks about DNA damage, which sounds really study, really dangerous or scary. Uh, but I have something in... Uh, an issue of psychotherapy and psychosomatics that traumatic stress induces DA, da, DNA damage. Something in the Auckland Cancer Society Reach Center said eating red meat and dairy products uh, is correlated with DNA damage. Uh, according to the one of the most prestigious uh, publications, 
that the sun can cause DNA damage even after it's set. Uh, another study uh, in the Medical Daily says that even moderate consumption of alcohol may have adverse effect on your DNA. Diet sodas contain something many regular sodas don't, mold inhibitors. These chemicals have the ability to cause severe DNA damage, uh, according to something published in Today Health and Wellness. In The Guardian, a prestigious UK paper, uh, sugary drinks may be linked to accelerated DNA aging. Leading a sedentary lifestyle, uh, according to something in the Archives of Internal Medicine, can cause DNA damage. Ultramarathon running, uh, in the journal Free Radical Biology and Medicine, can cause DNA damage. Uh, and then something in uh, some journal that I see here, uh, actually I don't know which one, says DNA damage from micronutrient deficiencies. So eating too much, eating too little, exercising too much, exercising too little, being exposed to the sun even after it sets, uh, drinking sugary drinks, drinking diet sodas, being stressed out, all of these things uh, can create DNA damage. So, and I think just simple aging can create DNA damage. So I think it becomes pretty clear uh, that if you are a researcher and you want to show that some particular product isn't good for you, like, eat, like electronic cigarettes, uh, it will be pretty easy to come up with, to design a study and to produce data that will indicate DNA damage uh, because it seems that almost every phenomenon that we're exposed to uh, will result in DNA damage. Now to the more exciting part of the show, uh, we are going to have a in memoriam uh, to a recently deceased smoker, the smokers seem to die, you know, almost 100% of smokers seem to die, while non-smokers, of course, never die. Uh, they go, they, they are immortal. And uh, we're going to go to, uh, again, this was in, um, where did I see this? I, this is in the Washington Post, and um, this is a really great photo, of course, uh, and the man's name is Jim uh, Bridwell, and this was he in uh, the year 2013, which is, of course, five, five years ago. Uh, and he died recently at the age of 73. Now, according to his wife, uh, he died from liver and kidney failure from hepatitis C, his wife, Peggy Bridwell, said. And she thinks uh, that it was on a trip in Borneo uh, that Mr. Bridwell contracted the disease. He received a tattoo uh, from a tribe of headhunters, as well as a severe stomach ailment. Uh, and this was uh, something that uh, at least Ms. Bridwell uh, gives us the cause of his um, getting hepatitis C. And, um, but this man is, uh, we've been talking a lot of climbers, and uh, Mr. Bridwell made historic climbs, mostly in uh, California's Yosemite Valley. And he climbed El Capitan, uh, which rises twice the height of the Empire State Building, which was a climb uh, that many people felt was impossible. But Mr. Bridwell did it, um, and he was the first to do it uh, in, in one day. And he also was uh, the first in an expedition that 
uh, circumnavigated Mount Everest, trekking 300 miles around the mountain and over some of its 20,000 foot sister peaks. And uh, he liked, many people thought he was really uh, too reckless, uh, but uh, in his mind, however, the hazards of injury and even death were part of what made scaling a mountain worthwhile in the first place. Adventure and excitement are the two things missing from civilization. Danger keeps you on your toes. You'll never feel as alive as when death is over your shoulder. Uh, let's see, and when he climbed El Capitan, according to uh, his biography, uh, and it was the first time that El Capitan was climbed in less than a day, uh, cigarettes dangled from Bridwell's mouth. Uh, they're dressed like hippies in loose-fitting vests and shirts, but they could just as well pass for Hell's Angels. Uh, and I find that also uh, when he made the climb, in addition to uh, the store of ropes, nuts, pitons, and water, they also took up uh, five packages of cigarettes. So um, another climber uh, is uh, in memoriam, uh, Jim Bridwell again, who died. Uh, at the age of 73, and obviously had been smoking for at least 50 years, uh, did not seem to kill him. Uh, he died from hepatitis C contracted in Borneo from a tattoo. Uh, very active man, was a ski instructor, um, and a giant in the field of, another giant in the field of, this was not actually in the field of climbing, but particularly rock climbing in uh, Yosemite Park, which is the kind of uh, epicenter for uh, scaling sheer cliffs. And I think, uh, as has been noted before, the effects of nicotine and tobacco on people is such that it uh, sharpens your reflexes, uh, improves your concentration, eases your anxiety, and um, probably was at least somewhat helpful uh, in making that climb. Plus, of course, as I said before in the program, uh, reduces uh, some of the uh, desires to eat. So you can go up and, and travel very lightly, not have to bring a lot of food, just a package of cigarettes or five packages amongst three men getting to the top of El Capitan in a day, and they don't have to bring all kinds of peanut butter sandwiches and whatnot that uh, non-smokers would probably feel uh, they need. And um, again, Jim Bridwell, who is in memoriam, uh, our smoker of the week, another climber, and um, happy to see him. Now, one thing I did notice on my trip, unfortunately, was uh, how effective uh, the anti-smoking campaign has been and um, you know because so most of the people uh, that I was smoking with were all going oh uh, I shouldn't smoke and I'm going to quit smoking and so forth and so on um, and I think that's unfortunate because uh, like Jim Bridwell says I mean you know this idea that it, that we have in civilization is that you're trying to avoid every possible risk and that your whole life is based on how safe and convenient things can be. And another thing that I didn't mention about this article, they said that uh, teenagers today are so scared of smoking, they think if they have one cigarette, uh, they're going to have uh, some illness or lung cancer in a matter of months. And this was because of the success of the anti-smoking campaign, but it's interesting that the journalist who wrote this, this doesn't seem to be a success because the teenagers don't seem to be getting, even by anti-smoking standards, an accurate 
uh, understanding of the supposed risks. It's far, far exaggerated, and therefore it's not true. So it seems like the journalist is actually saying, well, even if it's not true, it's good because it stops kids from smoking. We believe in the truth here on the smoking section. Thanks for watching.